for the time. Tea time. Yeah. This is tea time. Yeah. Make a difference. One cup at a time. Tea time. So be sure to grab your tea, grab a seat, and tune in to Miss Liz. Tea time. Tea time. Make a difference. One cup at a time. Well, welcome to Tea Time. That's right, Miss Liz is back in. It is evening tea time, and I have a returning guest here. Bob Burrell is here, and we're going to be talking about his new book, uh, Lancer, Hero of the West, The Virginia Affair. We're going to be talking about that. We're going to be talking about a bunch of other stuff, updates and all that good stuff. We're just going to sit back and spill a good, strong cup of tea with all of you guys tonight. Uh, tonight's tea is True, Enlightened, and Assist. That is the three words that Bob has given me. Uh, but before we get started, we're going to get you all over to Miss Liz's YouTube channel. Ring that little doorbell so you can tune into these tea times in the morning, afternoon, evening. Catch the replays. Leave your feedback, uh, comments, and all that section. Uh, reach out to the guests as well. So let's get started with this disclaimer and a, a little bit of uh, on Bob. And then we're going to get Bob in here and we're going to spill some tea together. Disclaimer for Miss Liz's Tea Time Live show. My Miss Liz myself is going live using StreamYard. Before going live, before leaving a comment, please grant StreamYard permission to see your name at StreamYard.com. Please be advised that the content brought forward for any Tea Time show hosted by myself, Miss Liz, is always brought forward in good faith. However, may bring forward dialogues and opinions that are not representative of my platform. The facts and information are perceived to be accurate at the giving time of airing. All tea time guests and audience participants are responsible for using their good judgment and taking any action that may relate to the discussion. The content brought forward may include discussions for some where they may be emotionally at risk. It's significant to know that the show is engaging in discussions, forms only to offer, inspire awareness and connection, and is not providing therapeutical advice. If you have any questions about the disclaimer or the panelist discussion, you may freely contact me, Ms. Liz, through my email at bookingmissliz at gmail.com. Moving forward, should you choose to voluntarily participate in tonight's show in any aspect, I myself, Ms. Liz, welcomes you. And should you decide that the show is not made for you at this time, I respect those wishes and we'll see you at a later show at a later date and time. And again, all tea time shows are done on Thursday, 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, unless it's a surprise, re rescheduled, or a special tea time that happens on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So now a little bit about my guests. Well, who is Bob? Well, Bob is a returning guest. He was on here last year for uh, when we talked about the tattoo murder. I believe we were talking about that in the back. So we're going to talk a little bit about that again tonight, just to give you a refresh on that. Uh, Bob Burrell is an award-winning journalist, author, filmmaker, and writer. For decades, he's been one of the voices of KN KNX News Radio the all-news radio station in Los Angeles. In his long radio career spanning more than 50 years, he's covered some of the biggest stories in the world. As an author, he has written and seen published and published 16 books, and as a screenwriter, he's written approximately 20. A native of Pittsburgh, PA, Bob got into radio to hopefully follow his beloved pirates as well as the Steelers and Penguins. And while he never did play-by-play, for those teams, he was able to cover local teams during his radio career. He writes a popular sports column, Baseball, in the 1960s and did a six-year stint, stint as a co-host of Kramer and Burrell. It was a podcast with former NFL quarterback Eric Kramer. Bob has Option, option 1 script and his book, Fan Letters to a Stripper, which led to the script Major League Stripper. It's based on the lives of former Berkeley's Ber Ber Queen Patty Wagland. I didn't say that word right. And her major league pitcher husband, Don Ro Rudolph. While he never met them, that, that he knows of his childhood cross paths with them. Bob is constantly working on to improve his craft, which can be seen in his Lancer, Hero of the West Western novel series, which is now up to seven books. There will be ten. He is currently working on several screenplays. Um, 
where am I? Several screenplays and books, which keeps him very busy while working at the radio station. Bob is married and lives in Los Angeles County. Let me get Bob in here and let me sip on my chicken soup because Miss Liz does have a cold. Welcome, Bob. Burlesque. <laughs> Burlesque. <laughs> See, I, I, my, my tongue, man, I'm telling you. I, you know no, what? I need a little bit of burlesque dancing, I think. <laughs> oh, there you go. You know, I, you could always use, say the word burlicue, too. A lot of people will use that. So, but that's, uh, yeah, it's that's that's another part of my life. Not that I've ever done burlesque. I've, you know, but because of the paddy wagon story, I've, I've learned a lot about that era and about that profession. And uh, it's, um, it, it's, it's fun. It, it really is. And a lot of people, like, oh, God, that's strippers and stuff. Yeah, it is strippers. It's classy. It's classic yeah. strippers. It's not, you know, raw and um, it can be, but most of the time it's not. Well, it was strippers with a style, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and she had some really good style. So, uh, uh, which is another another story uh, that has been in my in my life since 1959 when I was six years old, and that kind of dates me at this point. But that's okay. I haven't dated myself in a long time. So. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> So, Bob, for the viewers that didn't see you last season, tell us a little bit who you were as a little boy and who you are now. Oh, wow. As a little boy, you know, the thing about it is, uh, you know, I always wrote. You know, I was always a writer because I remember being five, six, seven years old and writing jokes for people in the family, you know, and telling those jokes. And they would laugh. And, of course, I was a cute little kid. I mean, I was. I had a little bow tie, you know, and the whole thing. And I they would laugh. And I, you know, of course you get the laugh and the applause. That's what you want. And, you know, it encourages you. So I've always been a writer and I always did a lot of reading and I've always told stories. I've always been a storyteller, which is more of what is, I guess I'm about than anything. Uh, I mean, whether it's just telling stories uh, in at work or whether it's on the radio, telling news, you know, reading news stories or, um, that kind of thing. But I always, always, from the day I picked up a baseball glove or a baseball, that's all I really wanted to do outside of telling stories was I wanted to play baseball. And I figured that's what I wanted to do as a career. And at some point, uh, you know, obviously that didn't happen. And which is you know, like <laughs> anything worth doing, it's really tough to do, you know, and break in there. But um, in the fifth grade, um, Mrs. Dunn at you know, Melvin Elementary in San Fernando, California, uh, had us write an essay of what we wanted to do when we grew up. And I wrote a story about how I wanted to go play for the Pittsburgh Pirates. I was going to go graduate high school, drive to Florida, uh, try out, and I was going to be signed on the spot, right? And she says, okay, that's all well and fine, but what's a backup? Uh, what's your backup? And I said, backup? What's a backup? She goes, you know, if you can't make it, you know? And I said, well, I mean, you know, I, I kind of, Felt I was going to make it, but okay, if that's what you want. And so I thought and thought and thought, and I said, you know, what would keep me close to baseball? I mean, that's what I wanted to do. And I thought, well, play-by-play. -play. You know, and I, I love play-by-play. -play. I, I used to listen to my favorite play-by-play -play guy, and that was uh, Bob Prince of the Pirates. And later on, you know, obviously in Los Angeles, you listen to Vin Scully, you know, who uh, has also since passed away. And those are two of the best, uh, probably out of the top ten, uh, of all time, as far as radio play-by-play -play guys. And uh, so that's what I decided. And right out of high school, I went to broadcasting school and I was going to uh, San Fernando Valley State College, which is now Cal State Northridge. At the same time, I had one class just to keep my, you know, so I could say I was going there. And um, in four months of broadcasting school, I graduated and I went to work. I never went back to college. And uh, so I, I've been working basically ever since. That was 1972. So it's been 52 years since I got my first job and I've been working in radio ever since and doing something while doing other things at times too. And uh, so, but yeah, and that's kind of where that was. I, I did get to do some local play-by-play. -play. I never got to do, um, I did co college play-by-play -play and local play-by-play -play in Fresno, but I never got to do um, a professional sport. 
you know, which is what I always wanted to do. And at this point, you know, it's not going to happen. So, um, you know, unless I get invited to the booth because I sold a screenplay that won an Academy Award and I happen to be there and they said, and they're going to find this out and say, well, you want to call a couple of innings? You want to call an inning? Yeah, sure. I'll call an inning. Why not? You know, <laughs> so that that's my only hope of doing that at this point in my life. So, uh, Bob, I want to get into the baseball because I just had yeah. that Claudio Re Resinol on and he was a baseball scout. Uh, mm -hmm. I want to get more into this baseball because we didn't sure. talk about baseball the last time we were together. So what did, did, yeah. tell me a little bit more about this baseball. I know you do some card collecting in that as well. Don't uh, you? Yeah. Well, I, I've been a card collector since I was six and um, I became a dealer and owned a baseball card store in Ventura in the nineties, uh, had it for 13 years and while doing radio at the same time. And I, I still buy and sell. You know, I, I deal mainly in vintage, uh, anything before 1975, really. I don't really deal in anything since then unless, you know, it comes up and just happens to happen. But, um, and I, you know, I saw on eBay under the name Brill Pro, which is my company, Brill, Brill, Brill Productions. So, um, and I have a, an eBay store and I, you know, I've got thousands of things to put up there. I've got 500 up there now and they sell. You know, occasionally, I, if I make four or five sales a month, that, that's pretty good. But um, uh, as far as uh, I, I write, of course, as you mentioned, the weekly baseball column called Baseball in the 1960s. And I, I created that because, to me, that was the last great era of Major League Baseball. Oh, 1969, uh, the Pirates won the World Series in 60. And my hero, Bill Mazeroski, was the hero of that series. And in 1969, the end of the decade is when we went to uh, divisional play and then interleague play. And, and, and to me, that as a purist, that ruined it for me. I mean, I still follow it, obviously, and I'm still into it, but it, it ruined that part of it for me. And so to me, the 60s was the last decade, great decade. And if you, the things that guys did in the 60s will never, ever happen again. I mean, Koufax and Marischal and Gibson, those guys were pitching 300 innings a year. Oh, and wow. now, you know, if a guy pitches 160 innings, that's a lot because they limit their pitchers because the guys throw so hard. You know, everybody throws 95, um, 95 miles an hour. And back then, if a guy threw 95, that was a lot. He may have, but we didn't have the guns and radar guns and things like that uh, to determine that like we do now. And, of course, everything – um, was broken down and changed with Bill James and his analytics, which I love Bill James. Don't get, get me wrong. But his analytics were uh, just changed the game drastically. Now, in 1967, 1966, 1966, the Pirates were looking, they had just changed managers. They were looking for a manager. And as a 13-year-old, I wrote a letter and applied for the job. <laughs> I still have the rejection letter they gave me. Uh, I still but have it. You tried, right? <laughs> yeah, it was it was great. I it, it's in my files, you know, and I I there's proof that I actually applied for manager of the Pirates, and I at the time thought of using computers long before Bill James did, and uh, now I sort of regret that. I kind of, mm -hmm. you know, computers, yeah, you know, for some things, but really, you know, baseball is like anything else, and I've written a book um, called Beating the Slump. And it's just a, like a 35 page book that's on Amazon for like six bucks. And it talks about uh, breaking a slump and how to do it, whether it's a golf swing or whether it's a baseball batting swing. And it came to me through um, a man who I dearly admired and became friends with, Sid Thrift, who was the general manager of the Pirates during uh, a stretch of the 70s and who we talked a lot about baseball, obviously. And uh, I created uh, a, a book about focusing when you're in a slump to take batting practice or take golf swings from the opposite side of what you normally do. And you don't try to drive it or kill it. You just try to meet the ball. And it helps refocus your brain. It's nothing about left brain, right brain. It's none of that. But it helps you refocus. And the whole thing about hitting a round bat, uh, taking a round bat and hitting a round ball, moving at 75 to 95 miles an hour or more is all about focus. And same thing with hitting a golf ball. 
you have to focus. There are certain mechanics that are important, but if you can't focus on doing that, forget it. And it, this lefty righty thing helps you refocus. And I carry in my golf bag, I carry two left-handed clubs just for that. And um, while I'm not a switch hitter, you know, uh, in, if I was playing baseball still, uh, my thing was I could actually try not to look stupid. And that's what you have to do in this, this theory in my book. And it works. Everybody I've shown it to and told it to tried it and it works. And I, I sent out uh, a few months ago, I decided, you know, I'm going to send out a copy of the book to every major league general manager just to see what happens. And if I can help anybody, I would. And I got no responses, zero, absolute zero, wow. which is fine. Uh, some of them probably never got to the general managers. They were probably flagged before they got there. And some of them, I'm sure, did get to the general managers. And they said, who's this guy? You know, crackpot. And, <laughs> and we got we got we pay people millions of dollars to work on swing and swing coaches and stuff like that. Why do we, you know, this guy thinks he's going to solve the problem of certain players like that? Yeah because it works it freaking works you know and um and if i if i didn't have the the backing of sid thrift on it because it turns out they used to teach this very theory at the kansas city royals academy which only lasted a few years and that's sid was head of that academy and it's something they used to teach there so i'm not a crackpot when it comes to this and i know it works and i know people believed it worked at one point and I've seen it myself and worked on it myself. So that's that's another side, <laughs> another side of Bob Brill. You know, <laughs> but I was just going to ask you, Bob, did you ever play baseball? I did. Uh, I played uh, up until the time I was eighteen. Uh, of course, I played little league and all that, uh, and, and Colt League and Babe Ruth baseball. Managed a little bit of Babe, Babe Ruth baseball. Uh, got cut from my high school team, um, but I did play semi pro, not pro. I played semi-pro in L.A. Uh, for about two years, and then I wiped out my ankle for the third time. Not broke it, but, you know, wiped it out. And uh, it was time to start my radio career. I was on the downhill side at 18. I knew I wasn't going to go anywhere there, and I had uh, the challenge of continuing to do that and stay in L.A. or go out and start my radio career, which is what I chose to do. So what do you like about radio, Bob? Thing about radio, I love radio. I mean, it's it really is theater of the mind. Um, there's a lot of things I don't like about radio, but the thing I like most about radio is I get to tell stories that people can't see. They have to imagine in their minds. And, and we use actualities, you know, voice clips, voice cuts of, you know, whether it's presidential or feature stories or whatever it is. You know, whatever the editors put in our stories or if we're creating a story, whatever we put in. And I really like the production angle of it as far as um, when I was at UPI Radio Network, I kind of handled the obits, especially for the West Coast, the obituaries. And a lot of that for radio, of course, if a musician dies or a singer dies, you're going to use music, some of his music in the clip that you put, you know, the voice piece you put together. And if it's a, a movie star or actor or something, you're going to use movie clips, the audio portion of that. And I compiled probably about a thousand pieces for obituaries uh, in the files. And so, and I, it's one of the things I do very well. I'll have no bones about saying that. And one of my editors, every time somebody dies, says me do a, an obituary piece. Um, I, I enjoy doing them. Don't ask me why. I love ancestry. I love history. I'm I'm definitely a history buff. I mean, I go deep into my family history and research, and I love the research part of it. And uh, so the obituary part is part of you know part of it. There. I mean, I look at it this way: dying is just just a part of living. It's just the final part. Yeah, we're all going to do it. It's, if you if you ever live, you're going to die. Your story. <laughs> yeah, and um, so it, it's if you can make somebody's life interesting even though they're not around anymore and they may be looking down or in some cases looking up uh you know they uh they may enjoy what you did but you know it's just i like using three or four pieces of sound i mean a piece of an interview piece of someone who knew them piece of music piece of um clip and that's one of the just things i enjoy about radio too and just basically being able 
for nobody to see my voice. Of course, they have to imagine what I look like, which these days is pretty easy to do because my face is everywhere. And um, so just letting them hear the story I have to tell and whatever that story is. Yeah, because I, I, I found on your website, hey, instead of me filling up this page, go Google me and yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, that's pretty cool. Like, if you're not looking, and I say that all the time, if people don't find missiles, you're not looking. Yeah. You know, yeah, I think I come up research. on mm -hmm. a Google search, I think I come up about 17 in the first 20. Um, oh, wow. And if you Google Bob Brill reporter, I come up 20 in the first 20. And there's a couple other guys out there. I mean, I tell people, I say, look, I'm not Bob Brill, the drummer for Berlin. I'm not Bob Brill, the um, uh, Broadway and Oscar winning um, set designer. I'm not Bob Brill, the uh, inter um, IP attorney in Chicago. And you better believe I'm certainly not Bob Brill, the bodybuilder. <laughs> That guy, it's like, whoa. Well, it's pretty cool when you, you know, when you do Google your name and you see all these different faces, right? You're just like, oh, mm -hmm. yeah, because I do that every 30 days. I check, I, I Google That's not what I do. <laughs> What's that say well, about us, right? Yeah, right. Where am I? Where, where they got me now? Where, and where are they sticking me now? <laughs> when my ego isn't big enough, I got to go search myself. Or? But it's also a good way to see if anybody is using your name in that as well, right? That's true. That's true. Especially now with AI and yeah. voice work, because we just signed a law or Governor Newsom signed a law in California just this week that um, no one can use AI to recreate your voice without your permission. And they can't put it in the fine print that you gave permission, you know, just by signing this document. Yeah. And it's really important because, I mean, obviously Hollywood is in California, and uh, it's the second biggest media cat. Uh, you know, I mean, you could do it for free. You go to a, a website. Uh, it's uh, what's called um, um, something Blast. Uh, can't think what it is right now, but you can go there, and for free, you can get voices, or you can go and create a voice. And it's too easy uh, to take my voice right now as I'm speaking to you and take that and then recreate it and slip it in some commercial somewhere and not pay me, Yeah, you know? And uh, and just that infringement is really, really scary. And AI is moving so fast yeah. that it's just uh, uh, unbelievable. And I'm surprised that, you know, well, I'm not surprised at how, how fast it's moving. Yeah, it's moving pretty fast. I, I know that I heard Randy Travis and I know that he had a heart, heart stroke and he couldn't sing. Mm -hmm. And he's got a whole new album out there with using ai and yeah. voices and and when i first heard the song i was like oh god he's got his voice back he you know he's back randy's back yeah. and then i and then i found out that it was through ai i was like wow i, I don't know if i like that yeah well it's like what they did with christopher reeve you know i mean he comes yeah. out walking out at the oscars you know and first of all he's been dead you know and before that you know he was you know incapacitated just uh, just totally disabled and um what you can do with this medium that we have now that is just um everybody has and and pretty much in the world with few exceptions uh, is it's phenomenal and it's only going to get more powerful yeah so bob i want to go back to the book that we talked about last season we talked about the mm -hmm. tattoo murder and we talked about it a little bit back in, before we went live. So right. do you want to share a little bit about that book? And then, and then we'll get <laughs> into part, the land. What part do you want me to share? <laughs> Everybody buckle up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I decided after writing some Westerns and some other books, I, I wrote a memoir uh, about baseball and my childhood, and um, which is a relationship book. And uh, I wrote another couple of books, one, um, two uh, nonfiction. And I decided I was going to write a crime novel. I really wanted to write a crime novel and I wanted it to be racy. And, um, so I created a character by the name of John Potenza. It's called the tattoo murder. And he's a different kind of cop, old school, 
living in Ventura, which is where I was when I was writing the book. And because it's, it's a, an old school community and it's on the beach and it's not as, not as expensive as Santa Barbara by far. And it's just a great place, place to live. And I knew Ventura because I partially grew up there, but <clears throat> excuse me. And um, so I decided to set it there. And Potenza is my uh, grandparents on my dad's side, um, family home in Italy, uh, the city of Potenza in the uh, province. And um, so I, I gave him that name and I made him Italian American, which I am. And I, with, I drew a lot from my past and, <clears throat> excuse me again, um, and, uh, you know, used a lot of that. My, my wife tells me that she finds a lot of me in the book, even today, and which is kind of scary based on what I'm going to tell you next. Um, <laughs> so I wanted this. I wanted this. Buckle up, guys. Race. It's coming. <laughs> I wanted this to be a racy novel. So, and John Potenza is sort of like a local James Bond. You know, he has a lot of women and he has his main squeeze. And um, which, by the way, isn't me. <laughs> you know? uh, never was. No, that's fortunate or unfortunate. But um, so I wrote the book and I wanted I guess I wrote the sex too. Well. I, I write sex very well. I really do. And uh, somebody asked me recently, well, how do you write? How do you write sex very well? And I said, I just go back to when I was a 13 year old and like let my fantasies run wild. But um, so I took the book once I finished it and I gave it to my daughter to read and she didn't read very much of it. And she goes, I can't read this. My dad wrote this. Dad is too sexy. There's too much sex. And it's like too graphic. And I said, really serious. Mm -hmm. And so then I gave it to my sister to read and same thing, you know, <laughs> Oh, I can't read this. I can't read this. So I took the book and I set it on the shelf and um, I, for 10 years. And I had a psychiatrist friend. No, she wasn't my psychiatrist. She's just, just a dear, dear friend of mine and who happened to be a psychiatrist. And we we're talking. And she read it and she goes, Bob, I love this book. You've got to get this out there. This is amazing. I love it. And it's like 330 pages. And I said, you know, but. Um, Doc, I mean, uh, she goes, no, no, just clean it up and, you know, do whatever. Rewrites clean it up. <laughs> and get it out there. And so I finally did. I rewrote the book. I, and basically, the book is the same as it was, except I toned down the sex. Uh, I really did. I, I didn't get as graphic. You know, and the thing is, I set it I set out for it to be a book that women would enjoy. Well, guess what? I didn't know what women would enjoy, and I'll say that right now. <laughs> like, uh, well, some women might. I I don't know. Uh, I'm not a woman, so that does you know. Um, and uh, when I showed it to uh, a publisher, a friend of mine, Jimmy Christine, Christina, who has now passed away, uh, Jimmy loved it. He says, "Well, I'll publish this right now." He said, "This is great. I love this book. I said, I love it. I love it." And I said, "Okay," and that's that's how it happened. Um, the interesting thing, which I usually don't tell people, and I'll tell, I'll share with you, is in prepping for the book, I went around town with a camera, and I went to all the spots that I knew where the scenes in the book were going to take place, and happened to find a woman there, whether she was relaxing on the beach or she was just, you know, having a cup of coffee at a Starbucks or something, and I walked up to them. And I said, "Look, I'm not a pervert. I'm not a weirdo." I'm writing a book and the book entails a detective who has a lot of women and I'm trying to get some ideas and your picture, you know, I'm just asking you, please, could I just take a picture of you? And, uh, and I don't want to see your face. I want your face turned away. Um, but I want to see, you know, a shot of you, whether you're sitting, standing, laying, whatever, and it won't be published anywhere that you have my absolute promise. And it, it never has been. Uh, and never will be, by the way. And um, and every woman I approached, there was like six of them, said okay. And um, one one woman said, uh, she was well endowed and was wearing a kind of a low cut top. And I said, I'm going to see that. And she said, Yeah, okay. And I said, All right. She goes, By the way, 
I've had stranger questions. I've had, had stranger questions before, but I've never had this one. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I said, okay, that's fine. And, uh, and but it was interesting that every one of the women allowed me to take those pictures, and I did use that in um, my um, some of my descriptions of the women yeah. that he dates and has affairs with, and um, uh, or who help him as well. And he has an Italian American family in. Uh, Ventura. His mom is uh, was a sort of a war bride, later on war bride. And his dad was a, a, a military man. They're both there. And his sister who runs a beauty shop. What else does a Italian American sister do? But she runs a beauty shop or a restaurant and this one runs a beauty shop. And uh, they're all involved. And I, I, I drew on some cousins and stuff like that. And uh, so it, it, it was a very fun book to write. It's the most detailed. And the two of the other things about it is it reads like a screenplay in that every scene is timed, dated, and um, uh, where. In other words, uh -huh. uh, at the top of every change in scenery, it tells the time of day, what day it is, um, the date, uh, and um, you know, the time of day, and if there's a weather, you know, if there's weather or whatever. <clears throat> and then the other thing I did even though it's a fictional book, I went out and I we took a bunch of pictures of places that where the events in the book happen or fictionally happen. And there's 10 pages in the middle of the book of real places where the fictional uh, action took place, which is, I don't know if it's ever been done before, but it was something I thought of a long time ago that I wanted to do. And it just, it works. You know, I, I felt you know, you may have five changes of scenery within a chapter. Well, you know, we all, when we're reading, when we're getting tired, we look to see how far to the end of the chapter, right? Is it four pages, five pages? Later? Now, in this book, you don't have to go that far. How far is it to the next scene? And it's broken up. And yes. and people like that, I've been told. And uh, they, I get a lot of comments on the uh, the photos, of which my wife gets credit for. So she's a photographer for that. Oh, well, that's cool. So how did you go from the the tattoo murder to the Lancer series? Or did the Lancer well, was series Lancer, first? Um, Lancer, I always wanted to write a Western. My, my father and I, when I was growing up in the 50s and 60s, um, most, well, not most, but a whole lot of the shows on television, the biggest genre, of course, was Westerns. I mean, and some of them were, you can still see on classic TV and stuff like that. But we watched Western. My dad loved Westerns. He read, told me once read every Zane Grey novel he could get his hands on when he was a child uh, growing up. And I read some Westerns when I was growing up, but not as much as him. But we would watch Gunsmoke and we would watch uh, um, The Rebel and, you know, all, all these shows in the 50s and 60s. There are only a few that we didn't watch. I go back now and I see there were a whole bunch more that I never watched. And... Uh, as a tribute to my dad, I always wanted to write a Western. But the thing with Western audiences, and readers especially, is they're really in tune to the era. They know what's what went on. And if yeah. you aren't super accurate in your description of a certain thing, they're going to nail you on it. And I always had that fear that was going to happen. And I didn't have time, really, for that kind of research. For instance, if... I, uh, in the New Orleans affair, a lot of it takes place on a riverboat. Okay, well, I couldn't name the riverboat the Nola Gay or whatever. Let's pull that name out of the sky. That was obviously the airplane that dropped the uh, atomic bomb. But I couldn't take that and put it in 1883 if it burned to the water level in 1881. Yeah. And if I wrote that, Western readers would pull that out and I'd get emails and whatever and bad reviews and whatever. So I was always nervous about that. But with Google and now AI, the research is like that. Um, I, I actually, <clears throat> excuse me, one book, I, uh, one of the Lancer books, I think it was um, Broken Bow, the one right before the Virginia City affair. Uh, Broken Bow, I um, had to figure out train schedules. And I literally, on Google, or through Google, I found train schedules for the time. Oh, and wow. I had to make sure that I couldn't take the train into Broken Bow 
because the train never went to Broken Bow. <laughs> so I had to get have Lancer get off at some nearby town, take it and take a horse and get to Broken Bow. And those are the things you have to really be concerned about when you're writing a Western. And once that came along and I figured that out, I said, okay, I can do it. And I wanted to write a series. I just didn't want to write a one-off. I wanted to create a character. And I, I spent weeks trying to come up with a name. And I wanted a royal name. And uh, I came, you know, I mean, Have Gun Will Travel, um, Paladin was uh, a royal name. Um, there was other ones, King, Queen, whatever. They were royal names. And I, uh, I wanted to call him by one name. And each book, more about his past, is revealed a little bit. And in book 10, which would be the final one, I'll tell the whole story of his past and uh, who, who he is, who he was, you know, family-wise and everything. And, of course, it's all created. But, uh, and it's, I already have it in my head. But um, so what I uh, did with that is in um, – I lost my train of thought. <laughs> That's okay. Let it slip. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, and so that that's important as far as the research is concerned. I, I think that's uh, the most important thing as far as um, westerns are concerned, and, yeah. and that genre for sure. So, how do you get the subtitles for your Lancer series? Uh, well, they're all uh, the something affair, and okay. I literally stole that from the man from Uncle. Um, because Man from Uncle TV show back in the days with uh, Napoleon Solo and Ilya Kuryakin, which was um, um, uh, Robert, um, I can't remember his last name, and uh, um, David McCallum. Uh, so uh, I, I, every one of their episodes was the something affair. And it could have been the Budapest affair, it could have been the two gun affair, or whatever. And I thought that was. A way to do it. I didn't want to um, uh, just give it a subtitle because that's today's world, especially almost every book has a subtitle. And I, growing up, it was just the opposite. And so I said, okay, I want to make it the affair that that works. So and each since Lancer is a good guy gunslinger who works out of Tombstone, at the height of Tombstone, in the early 1880s, he goes elsewhere to solve crimes or help people or whatever. And he's a wealthy guy, so that's not a big deal. Um, and so I have him go, if I have him go to El Paso, it's the El Paso affair. If I have him go to Broken Bow, um, Nebraska, uh, Wyoming, or Nebraska, uh, I have him go the Broken Bow affair. And the Virginia City affair is obviously uh, northern Nevada, uh, where the, uh, the Comstock load happened. Of course, this is after the Comstock load, so it's uh, that's referenced a lot, but that's about it. So, Bob, did you know right from the get-go that you would have 10 books in this series? I would have because um, I was writing one a year. And the idea was we used to have the um, Cowboy Festival in Santa Clarita every year, which is a suburb of Los Angeles. And uh, it's in L.A. County. And that's where I met Jimmy Christina, Christina and several other people who I still know very well. And uh, I, they would have – they'd set up what was called the uh, – the um, it was a, a book, a tent where all the authors were, the Western writers. It was all Western writers uh, brought together uh, by uh, a lady, uh, Bobby Jean Bell. And each year we would all join her there. And for two days, we would have uh, the uh, the book, uh, that part set up for, for authors. And people would come by and buy our books or we'd do signings and whatever. And it was a, a really nice opportunity uh, and a rare one to do something like that. But every <laughs> turned out that every year, every year, bar none, it happened on the same weekend as the LA Times Festival of Books, oh, which if most readers are going to go to that. And uh, we always got a decent crowd. We just never had the kind of numbers that uh, uh, we would hope for. And so uh this last year was the last year uh they first year they didn't do it so and it was just something the city of santa clarita chose not to do this time and it's it's always been a fun thing to do but uh that's that's kind of where that started and i decided we we're gonna do it every year i'd write a book every year and i would start writing in december have it published 
by March and the festival is always in April. So oh, I wow. have a new book for April and um, that's no longer. And then COVID hit and we didn't do it at all. And so I took a couple of years off and, but yeah, I would think I would probably be a number nine or 10 by now. Oh, wow. Yeah. So Bob, during COVID, did you do any writing at all? Uh, yeah. Um, I worked on some screenplays. Uh, trying to think what else I wrote. Um, I did because I had some time. But to be honest, with you, I was working like five days a week during COVID. Um, rather than, you know, most people were not working at all. I actually, you know, because of the coverage we gave to um, – uh, since we're an all news station, the coverage that we gave to COVID and the fact that some people were no longer there and are, you know, and the way that was everything just worked out that I was working five days a week instead of four days a week. And so since I work uh, two weeknights and I was doing three overnights, it kind of doesn't give you a whole lot of time yeah. to um, when you're not sleeping or dead on your feet to uh, write. And so I didn't write as much, but I did write. Uh, I think I'm trying to think which. Uh, well, I wrote Broken Bow during the uh, during COVID. I did write Broken Bow, and uh, I'm trying to think if I wrote anything else. I'm sure I wrote a couple of screenplays uh, during that time. And I actually we produced. I think the, I'm trying to think if we we actually produced one of the short films. Uh, no, what we did was the documentary. We shot the documentary called Shaken: The Great Somar Earthquake. Yes. it was the 50th anniversary of. I actually watched Somar that. Oh, did you like it? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I Good. watched it. Good, thank you. Thank you. Um, it, was, it was a labor of love and something I thought of 50 years ago. What am I going to do 50 yeah. years from now? Um, and uh, lived through that earthquake in Silmar. I was a senior at Silmar High School when it happened. And so I got together with a friend of mine, a co-producer, <clears throat> and we, we put out on Facebook on uh, the Silmar High School Facebook page about well, – not the fake official high school, but people that went to Somar High School or grew up in Somar. And I put it on. I said, we're doing this. Anybody that wants to come in for an interview, we'd love to have you. And we had some cancellations and we because we had to do it all one day because I was given the, the spot to do it uh, indoors. And we had to um, you had to come in by yourself. Some people came with a wife or a husband. And we had to have them outside while we did it. And uh we really had to isolate during that and sign waivers and everything. And we just really, really took precautions and because uh, we had to. And uh, we shot it. And, uh, you know, we did it all in the same room. We actually shot it in two days. We shot all the interviews in one day. No, I take it back. We shot the people from the high school or from Somar in one day. Then we, uh, we took two other days and interviewed at a local park outside uh the fire uh personnel and uh then we shot uh the two stand-ups that i did on another day uh one in front of the market where i was working at the time and one in front of the house where i was in front of my bedroom actually you know uh standing outside so uh and uh it, it's done okay you know it's on okay. um uh prime you can pay for it on prime or you can watch it with commercials on tubi for free so, yeah, that's where I watched it. I watched it on Tubi. On Tubi, yeah. And so you have to watch the commercials then. But, um, you know, uh, always a pleasure if someone wants to buy it on Prime because eventually I'll get some money from the production company or the, the, the distributor at some point, you know. Um, but the nice thing about it was it really was a sweat equity product, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, it didn't really cost us much at all to make. And um, it was a labor of love. So I mean, it was something I that's and we we put up a website called uh, Shake in the Movie, where people who didn't make it to uh, on on the show uh, and those who did still uh, that we we did interviews with we have their raw the whole interview with instead of just clips and that's yeah. on the website and also anybody that uh, called us and said gee I wanted to be a part of it and I said well it's over um, you can do a three minute clip and load it to the website. Or, or send it to my email and I'll load it to the website and just give me three to five minutes and you talking into your phone and I'll, I'll post it. And, uh, it's, it's been, it's been good. You know, I mean, the website's going to be there for a long time. 
hopefully. Yeah. And, uh, you know, people could still go back and see it and, and watch the, watch the video through you, like I said, um, Tubi and, uh, and Amazon. Yeah. You know, I really enjoyed it. You did an awesome job on that one. Thank you. Thank you. So um, Bob, I want to get into your tea because you gave me true enlightened and assist. So why those three words? <laughs> true enlightening and assist. Uh, true would be the journalistic side. I mean, you have to be true to your craft. Um, you have to be um, someone who is credible. You have to be credible. I mean, you, especially when you're writing fiction. Yeah. You know, I had a friend of mine uh, say, you know, uh, I told him, I said, writing nonfiction is so much harder than writing fiction. Fiction is easy to write. He says, yeah, because you can make stuff up substitute a different word for stuff, but outside of that. Um, and so, you know, you have to be true and the true means credibility. Enlightening to me is you, I don't think of how I want to put this, um, fresh, okay? okay? And always being fresh. And even may, though you may be doing something that's formulaic, where it's similar, but you always want to freshen that up within itself. In other words, um, never do the same thing all the time, but always do the same thing all the time, but be fresh about it. You know, yeah. always add new elements, always uh, make it so that whether it's a reader or the viewer or um, just people you're talking to of, you know, making it more entertaining and so that they want to watch it. And assist is... Oh, that, that's an easy one, you know, <laughs> always <laughs> listen to someone else, you know, because, you know, there's, everybody has advice, you know, and some people's advice, whether they're good at it or not, is really good. And some people's advice, whether they're good at it or not, is terrible, you know, but you have to listen to it, you know, and um, it's like, I don't want to get into politics, but it's like in our country, we're pol so polarized right now because we don't listen to each other, Yeah, you know, and it's difficult. I find it difficult for the side I'm on, which I won't, won't explain, um, but it really is difficult. And you have to, that's the way things work, you yeah. know, you, I mean, we, I know we were talking uh, ahead of time when you submit a screenplay, you may have 10 eyes on it and one of every one of them is going to miss one thing. One misspelling, you know, and it's going to get slipped by. Uh, a manager I'm working with now is, well, the first thing he said to me was, you can have 10,000 eyes on it, of course, Bob, and you're not going to catch every typo or yeah. um, wrong word, you know, like, and I, I'm terrible with there, 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 and there, you know, and um, everybody says, I, I don't know, I don't even know what a comma is, and but when I write news stories, I do because they have to be brief and they have to be, you know, it's like um, when you teaching writers of news stories, it's a totally different animal, you know, because you have to be brief and you, you know, it's like uh, you said in the first line uh, what it was. You, you can't repeat it because you already said it, you know, yeah. you're trying to be brief. And um, so, yeah, I, I think those are the three things that I would uh, put out there as far as those those three words that I gave you. Well, I, I always find it amazing on the words that my guests give me because you just never know where it takes you, right? Uh, yeah. I didn't think I would get fresh for enlightened. But, you know, <laughs> that, <laughs> it is a fresh new day, right? Yes, it is. <laughs> and you'll be enlightened every, all day. So, Bob, do you have anything coming up that you're working on? Any films, uh, screenplays, or anything like um, that? Yeah, uh, I, I do. I just finished. Um, uh, I, I had to rewrite um, a screenplay. I don't really do horror. Um, and horror is the easiest genre, genre to sell. Okay. And I've written two scripts in my past that could qualify as horror slash thriller. They're not, they're not slasher films. I wouldn't do those. But um, when I hooked up with his manager, he asked me if I had any horror films. And I told him I did. And I told him what the two were. And he asked for the one. And I had, uh, to be honest with you, I hadn't touched it in 10 years. 
I had not touched it and I needed to get it to him fast. And I should have spent a whole lot more time cleaning it up, re rewriting it. and Because I'm a much better screenwriter than I was 10 years ago. And um, he came back and said, you know, blah, 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 blah. You know, I said, give me a second chance. Give me a, a week and a half. He goes, okay. Because he liked, he said, I love the idea. I love the idea, but the mechanic, I said, just hang on. I, I rushed it. Uh, give me a, give me a second. He goes, yeah, okay. So I went through it. I rewrote it. Uh, I added 10 pages. No, I actually added 15 pages. Created a couple of new characters uh, and let my mentors read it. They both liked it. Sent it back to him. And he said, he got back to me pretty quickly. He said, I love it. I absolutely love it. And um, he's basically, he's in the process of shopping it. Um, and it's called, you know, love this, Radio Waves, Mama's Dead. Oh. And it is basically a fictional story set in what used to be a men state mental institution and is now a college. And that is actual fact. Um, Camarillo State Mental Hospital uh, which closed, I believe, in the 70s, uh, late 60s, early 70s, um, became, set dormant for a long time, and became Cal State University Channel Islands. And I, in my script, it's Cal State Ventura Beach, you know, because it's right on the beach. It really is. And it's basically about a woman who's a girl who's now 18 entering that college who was there as a toddler and didn't know it. Uh, when her mother was committed there oh. and it goes back and forth and there's a reincarnation of the mom and uh, um, and the key to it is the woman who was the administrator when it was a mental hospital is now the administrator of the university and her and a local cop ran a prostitution ring out of the mental hospital and that's about where I can leave it. And, and all how all that comes around and the radio waves is part of that in there too because the girl's boyfriend is a local disc jockey oh well, look at that it happened at the radio station and and you know it's sort of a sort of a ghosty thing but it's all young people so that's one of the keys to it except for you know uh two well three characters and but it's basically set in a college, you know, a college setting, university setting. So that that is the most prominent one. Uh, I've just written first draft of another screenplay that's based on a true story set in the 1800s. Uh, that's about all I can tell you because I haven't copyrighted it yet. And uh, I have uh, finished the first draft of a international thriller book, um, which is called Five Seconds to Die. And that is in front of uh, the agency. And hopefully once they get back to me on that, they, they get the first 20 pages, you know, see if they want to go further. Uh, and I think they will. I'm, I actually wrote the book to be a movie. And let's see what else. Uh, there's one more too. I did write a children's book, but I. I yeah, we did talk about, about that before we went. Yeah. Um, it's uh, I wrote this children's book on a story I wanted to tell on some teenagers in a small town and uh it's a fun book it's a it's a teenage thriller uh and it's about three three friends of course three friends what else uh two guys and a girl and uh it it, it it's a really fun story i will be honest with you <laughs> i wrote it in 48 hours um it's about 65 pages i guess uh and my current publisher um doesn't really it, they've streamlined they don't do children's or ya books and this is you know young teenagers so uh i'm until i feel like i want to check out another publisher and uh that kind of stuff and then i get some of those other things off my plate i've set it aside hopefully it won't be 10 years like the uh the tattoo murder but um it it was a fun book to write i i kind of wanted it to be a series and hopefully it will be and uh, oh and the other thing oh yeah golly uh we had it come out we're shopping it now i wrote and produced and half directed um 
a short film that is actually a pilot for a series. And it's called The Adventures of Taekwondo Martial Arts Detective. And it's a comedy, obviously, with that title. And you can see it on YouTube. It, it's on YouTube. You can go to my YouTube channel, Bob Brill, and uh, you can find it there. Or just search for uh, The Adventures of... Make the whole title, The Adventures of Taekwondo Martial Arts Detective. Because you just Google or search martial arts, you're going to get a billion things. And the thing about it is, uh, it's won some awards at, at film festivals. It was really well done. The production guys, uh, S-A-V-E production, uh, are just great. We're working on some other things together. And um, the uh, thing about it is we've won a few awards, but it I ended it in the Hong Kong Indie Film Festival as a pilot, and it finished as a semifinalist. We're waiting to hear from the Tokyo Indie Film Festival and if it does well there, uh, I'm going to plaster Netflix and find anybody I can to talk to. Because if you got a comedy martial arts film that does extremely well in Hong Kong and extremely well in Tokyo, you got something. You know? right. <laughs> I don't care what anybody <laughs> says. And it, it's it's a comedy. I mean, uh, I took a lot of the chop sake things uh, from the, the films that you know, we used to watch years ago with Bruce Lee. Oh, I love Bruce Lee. Um, you know, guys jumping backwards up a mountain type thing and uh and the, the martial arts is great and one of the guys who was acting in narayan i can't think of narayan's last name um his first name is narayan was also in um uh everything everywhere all at once he had a bit part in that as a as a kung fu guy and uh he was great in this i mean he played up the comedy really well and it, it's uh, and I know he's in, they're using him a lot in their other short films that they're producing. And so it was it's it's out there. You can watch it. Um, please comment on it. One film festival, they, they gave us all the judges comments video wise and they loved it. And one guy said and these were young people. And one guy said, you know, it's obviously a series, you know, uh, you know, so hopefully we'll see more. And if you watch it, stay to the very end after the credits. Because the concept is we have Stan Vang, who's, who's the star. He's the martial arts detective. Um, we have him giving a martial arts lesson. It runs oh, about yeah. a minute. And at the end, that's the key is one of the keys is at the very end, he gives Stan gives a lesson of, uh, you know, something. Uh, he starts out this one with kicks. And uh, so it's, it's really a good concept. I know we have something. Hopefully, keep your fingers crossed. But this one's gonna, you know, find find a place somewhere in in uh, Hollywood. So, Bob, have you done any martial arts? Me? Yeah, <laughs> I can't. <laughs> no, I can barely spell martial arts. You just never know, right? That little no. thirteen-year-old no. boy. No, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't gonna happen. That's a capital A I N apostrophe T. Ain't gonna happen. <laughs> So Bob, I mm -hmm. I I asked you what your favorite color was, and you you gave me the color blue. Why blue? Um, my favorite color blue. Yeah. When I was a kid, my favorite color was red. Um, oh well, look at that! You changed. <laughs> <laughs> it became blue. It became blue a long time ago, and I don't really know why. I think I find blue pleasing. Um, it sort of highlights stuff. <clears throat> it's not. It doesn't yell at you. Um. And to be honest, the last three cars I've had have all been midnight blue. You know, oh. and I like all forms of blue. Um, and if you're looking at, like I'm looking at four things on my screen now. Well, I take it back. There's about 12 things on my screen now that are blue. And it's always very pleasing to me. Uh, and it's not offensive. You know, it's not blaring at you. It's, it's not, uh, it doesn't take on a personality of its own, like yellow or gold or silver. I mean, the yeah. things you identify with. Uh, it's sort of calming, and it. I guess that's why I've always liked it. And uh, I, like, as a kid, I was more aggressive, so I, red was there. But um, blue was all for decades, for most well, easily most of my life. Blue has been my favorite, and you can see, even see on my glasses there's blue. <laughs> that's because <laughs> I'm wearing computer glasses, right? <laughs> So they're blue. So Bob, any fi any final words before we wrap up tonight? Uh, I said a thank you. Um, let me think. Uh, yeah, 
I think I always tell people that um, the world is a crazy place, you know, and always keep things fresh uh, and remember history. You know, we always say, you know, you have to remember history. Well, yeah, and history is really important because even today, we're, why don't we remember what happened 100 years ago or 50 years ago? Because we're so wrapped up in the internet, stuff like that, where all the history is there. Anything yeah. you want to find in history, and because history teaches us something. So, you know, it's like, um, be a student of history. Don't be a victim of it. Because if you're a student of history, you're going to learn and you're going to remember and you're going to learn from what happened previously in this world or in your life. But if you don't, if you just let history go by, what happened today, which has happened many, many times in the past, is going to kill you. And you're going to be a victim of history. And you don't want to be a victim of history. You want to be a student of history. And that's kind of the mantra I live by. And um, uh, and that's kind of where I'm at. That's what I'd, I'd, I hope to leave the world with. If you can put that on my tombstone, of course, I'm not going to have a tombstone because I'm going to be cremated. And, or, or the other thing, oh, mulched. I'm thinking about being mulched, you know. Away. Whoever's there can just have better plans. You know? Just so, me. It'll probably be a brown plum for me, so they'll probably kill the plant. Well, thank you so much, Bob. It was an honor to have you back here and, and just sitting and chilling. You know, that, that's what we do when we get together. We just sit back and chill. Yeah, uh, so I love it, thank you. Sense. Thank you for joining me. Thank you to the listeners and audience who are been listening tonight. And if you watch the replay, please push hashtag. Uh, replay where you're tuning in from because Miss Liz always likes to know where your guys are coming in from. Uh, we will be back on the 23rd. John Callis will be back and he'll be giving us some updates. So he'll be talking about Hollywood and books and all that good stuff. So we're going to keep on with the films and keep it moving. And then we'll be uh, wrapping it up at the end with uh, a local business that Miss Liz has got to experience and it's called the True Float. So it's a salt spa. So we're going to be talking about that salt spa on how you just sit and float in this water. It is amazing. Oh. So we're going to have uh, two amazing local business owners coming in and sharing about that and how you can get a part of that. And then we're going to wrap up with a returning guest from season one. Amy Hutton's will be back with Empower Women Empowerment and her story of coming out in her 40s. So we're going to wrap it up. And on the 24th of um September, look out for Miss Liz's October lineup, which will be coming out. The press release should be out by the 24th. So check out those guests as well. And we'll be joining in two new countries. So Miss Liz is going to be pushing it up to 72 countries in five years. So uh, wow. that's how Miss Liz works. So until then, I will see everybody on Monday with a new TEA. And we'll do this all over again. So keep serving your teas. Keep being true to yourself. And let's make a difference one cup of tea at a time.